Am I ready? Hey everybody, welcome to the end of GDC. Uh, my name is uh, Royal McGraw. I'm a writer, producer, and designer at Pixelberry Studios. Uh, this is Kara Liu. Uh, she is lead writer and studio manager at Pixelberry. Uh, before we get started, a little bit of bookkeeping. Uh, we don't look too crowded. But we do have some gameplay footage with somewhat small text. So if you're at the very back and you want to read it, you, you may want to move forward. Uh, other than that, um, we're supposed to remind you to turn off cell phones. So, you know, vibrate. All right. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with High School Story? Uh, that's a good number. That's a good number. Um, Okay, hopefully the talk today will uh, help illuminate why we do some of the things that we do. Uh, for the rest of you guys, uh, let's do a little bit of an introduction. All right, High School Story is a high school simulation game. It's available uh, for iOS and Google Play. In High School Story, you create the high school of your dreams. Uh, you can choose your click. This is jocks, preps, and nerds. You can throw parties with your friends. You can go on dates. You can send your classmates on dates. You can dress up like a witch and party with a vampire. <laughs> All right, so the thing that most differentiates a high school story from the, the other apps in the market is the story. A lot of games, they pay lip service to story. Uh, what they would call story, we would call maybe a setup, an introduction, it'd be the, the land that you inherit, the store you decide to open. Uh, but in high school story, we really put the story in high school story. So there's not just a little bit of story either. Uh, we have over a thousand unique quests. Uh, we have hundreds of scripted dates and breakups. Uh, all in all, we're talking over 200,000 words. So to just put that in a little bit of perspective, uh, that gets you two pretty robust young adult novels. All right, so what does the story in High School Story actually look like? So we have an example. This is a quest log from the game. This is actually my personal quest log that I'm playing through right now. Uh, so you can see on the left there are different icons that indicate the different stories going on. Um, so each of these represents a quest chain. It's kind of an ongoing story made up of several little quests. So first, my band is playing at a music festival, kind of a big deal. Uh, my friends are throwing Kimmy a Sweet 16 birthday party. I'm sending some people out on some dates, playing Cupid. And then my friends are also throwing a Spring Fling dance. Um, so you can see we try to have a lot of different things going on in the game. So it's multiple story tracks that people can check back in on every time they come. And also, after people collect on any given quest, quest link in the chain, you get a little clip of dialogue playing between the characters. And so I'll show you a quick example of that. So this is what plays when you collect on the Spring Fling quest. And this is kind of the setup for the story. You'll see two of the characters interacting, and it kind of launches you into the narrative of what's about to happen over the course of the Spring Fling.
So you can see from this clip that the story is pretty substantial. We don't just give you the bare minimum setup of, you know, oh, you should buy some flowers. We really want to show the characters, and we want to show them coming into conflict with each other, and we want to put you right in the middle of that. Um, so in addition to that, we also are releasing two to three new quest chains every single week. So you can imagine that's a lot of adventures that our cast has gone on so far. Here are some examples of things we've done. We've done a ski trip, Olympics, Spring Fling, most recently a St. Patrick's Day. And uh, yeah, so it just is ongoing in that way. All right. So the important thing to know about high school story is that we don't just have a lot of story. We're not just cramming story in there. Uh, story informs every single design decision that we've made. So uh, just as an example, uh, this is the core game loop in high school story. You enroll students. Uh, students earn coins. You spend the coins to buy hangouts. Hangouts have slots to allow you to enroll more students. That's not like crazy. You know, it could be uh, in another game. It might be something like uh, plant crops. You sell the crops for coins. That gets you seeds. You can plant them and get more crops. Uh, so it's, it's all like pretty basic stuff with one pretty dramatic exception. Here you can see the core game loop is constrained within story. So what, is, what exactly does that mean? All right. Playing high school story, basically the story is mandatory. Uh, story gates leveling. You can't get from level one to level two without playing through some story. But you also can't get to level... 20 from level 19 without playing through some story. Story gates new clicks. Uh, at the beginning, I showed you jocks, preps, nerds. Well, we've got some other ones, too. We have artists, slackers, rebels, musicians. Uh, we have all the various types of uh, students you can get if you party those together. Well, to see any of those, uh, you're going to have to play through some story. Uh, the final thing that story gates, uh, and this is actually the big idea, what we're hoping to convey today, uh, is that story gates more story. So, you might be asking yourself, why do we do this? 200,000 words is a ton of words, 1,000 unique quest events, that's a ton of extra complexity. Uh, and you're absolutely right, it is a lot of extra complexity. Uh, it's one of the reasons we haven't localized the title yet. Uh, but we've done sort of the math internally, the pros and the cons. Uh, and we think it's absolutely worth it. So. You know, if you just take a, take a look at this top-down view of the world, uh, you can move buildings around, you can tap on students, you can change their clothes. That's really fun. You're kind of like a god with your own like, perfect high school. But the problem is, you're kind of at an emotional remove. We want to take the player out of this top-down view and make them feel like they're actually a student at this sort of idealized high school. Uh, so... We use story to do that. Once we get them down there, once we give them these story-based best friends, these story-based romantic interests, once we've gotten that connection, then we can use story to, put, to evolve their romance or maybe like put their best friends in a bind. Once we've got that, we've got them really anticipating what's going to happen next in the story. And once they're doing that, we're absolutely sure they're going to come back. Uh, we're going to get to our retention numbers kind of towards the end of the talk. Uh, if any of you guys saw Andrew Schwartz's talk earlier in the week, you'll know they're pretty good, so definitely stick around for those. All right, so for now I'll talk a little bit more about both the tools that we use to create this narrative and also how we set up our team to do it. Um, so first off, we have a unique studio structure. Out of 16 employees, we have eight writers, and this is the team that's dedicated to crafting the ongoing narrative. And so why do we have eight? Well, this is not necessarily a magic number. Um, we've just found that this is what works for us. So some of the reasons why include brainstorms. We've found that any given writer, if you give them a prompt, you know, write about the spring dance, they will be able to do that. Um, but if you really want the story to go further and you want to make sure you're telling the best story that you can at this particular moment, it's good to have ide people to bounce ideas off of. So maybe one person will say, oh, you know, Autumn made that New Year's resolution where she wanted to try new things. Maybe we should have her try to do it. And someone else might say, well, Peyton's not going to like that because she usually plans all the dances. And then suddenly you have a conflict and, you know, people are working together to come up with that. Another reason is just for editorial and review. This is pretty basic. You don't want a lot of typos in your game. You don't want grammar errors. All of those work to throw the audience out of the game. So you want them immersed in it and feeling like these are real characters talking to them. You don't want them thinking, oh, the writer messed up and put a typo in there. 
Um, and the last reason for us is that we're able to subdivide people up into groups. So we don't necessarily have every writer working on every quest. I used uh, this example earlier of my quest log. <coughs> And so obviously, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want all eight writers trying to write about one spring fling, uh, too many writers. Um, but you can kind of divide them up. So we, what we do is we put groups of two to three writers in each of these quests. So maybe one group is writing about the quest chain about making your band. Maybe another group is writing about the spring fling and so on. All right. So getting into the narrative tools that we use, uh, this is kind of an overview and we'll go through each of these in more detail. But the ones that we want to focus on today are characters, romance and drama, comedy, choices, and cliffhangers. <coughs> and if you do all of these correctly, and we feel that you know we did in high school story, then you end up with heartthrobs, emotional engagement, viral screenshots that people want to share, and player investment. All right, so let's start with characters. We in high school story rely on a lot of stereotypes when we're introducing characters. And stereotypes are something that you usually hear spoken of very negatively. People will say something is stereotypical if they feel like they've seen it before, it's nothing new to them, it's kind of played out. But when you're trying to pack a lot of story into a small space, like how you're doing when you write for games, you don't want the story to take over or get in the way of the gameplay. You really want to tell the story quickly, at least in the beginning, and then kind of get out of the way. The worst thing you can see is a player spamming through dialogue because they feel like they just want to get to playing the game. And that's particularly bad for a game like High School Story, where the story is so much of the gameplay. So what we try to do is pack it in tightly in the beginning when you're introducing things, and then let it expand more when you have more time with players. So we use stereotypes to introduce the characters, but then we build on them later in later quests. So here is a classic example from film. This is The Breakfast Club. So people hopefully can recognize some of the high school tropes that are pretty common. You see the guy in the letterman's jacket and you think he's a jock. You see the guy with the long hair and the leather gloves and you're like, he's probably a bad boy and so on. Um, the important thing is everything from how they're dressed to their postures to their hair tells you something about these characters that you can immediately uh, glean without even necessarily hearing them talk. So we use kind of those same strategies. and. For that, I will introduce you to Julian. He is one of our leading heartthrob characters in High School Story. You can probably tell from his letterman's jacket that he's a jock, and you can hopefully tell from the football under his arm that he loves football. And based on those two things, you might kind of conclude that he's an alpha male, he's probably pretty competitive, things like that. And that's exactly how we introduce Julian to the audience when we first introduce him in High School Story. You meet him as a character who wants to transfer to your school because he's having problems with his current school's football team. Because of some politics with the coach, he's not being allowed to play. He really wants to come to your school if you'll let him start a football team there. So through the course of getting to meet him, you know, that's pretty much where we leave it. You recruit him to your school, you start this football team, and it's only once he's in your school that we start to dig deeper with his character and introduce more contradictions and quirks to the stereotype. So once you get to know him a little better, you find out that he's actually really worried about paying for college. He doesn't get the chance to decorate often, but when you kind of push him to decorate for a school dance, he really enjoys that. And he also really wants to be a better student, but he's not quite sure how to go about doing that. So these are all traits you wouldn't necessarily assume go along with being a jock, and hopefully will they contradict the stereotype in a meaningful enough way that people are able to see him as a fully fleshed out character. All right, so one of the metrics that you use, obviously, to determine if players are understanding and beginning to engage with your game is tutorial completion. So we're using, these, we're using what players are bringing into the game, their own experiences, in order to sort of like set the stage, let them feel comfortable with what's happening. Uh, and then after that, we're sort of evolving it. Now, is, is it working? Well. A, a pretty good, something you might shoot for, tutorial completion, would be around 70%. Uh, in high school story, using, using these techniques, we've gotten our tutorial completion up to 87%. Uh, and then, once they're through the tutorial, they basically have some buy-in. We're probably going to have some time with them. So our average first-time play session is 19.6 minutes. That means we can introduce a character, leave them pretty flat at the start, and then know and trust that we'll have the time to sort of deepen that character over the next 20 minutes. Yep. 
So just to summarize, make sure you evolve your characters after you introduce them. If you are going to use stereotypes, and make sure you use them sparingly. Um, and so we've told you that this makes players care. And so I have a couple examples of what players are saying about Julian in the game. Uh, so these are some player reactions that we've spotted on Twitter and on forums. Um, one person just checking Julian out, saying he looks hot. Um, another player has asked a question. In one of the quests where you get to make your band, Julian is your drummer. And you find out he's maybe not the best drummer. And you have a chance to kick him out of your band. And maybe you'll have a better chance at winning the music festival. Um, but this player is really in dilemma because, as she says, she really wants to win, but she doesn't want Julian to be angry with her. And so you can see she's really treating him like an emotional person that is going to be interacting with her, that she's accountable to. Uh, another thing is, because we have dating in our game, and because you can date Julian, we've found that Julian has a number of girlfriends throughout the world. And they like to post about how they are dating Julian on Twitter. And these are just a few examples. And they also get really excited when they find out that other people are dating Julian, too, uh, which is kind of a funny response. Um, so just people saying, I have a boyfriend, his name is Julian, we're online official. Uh, so, next I want to talk a little bit about how we build up these, these contradictions in the characters and how we move away from the stereotypes. So, we want to make sure the way you're getting to know the characters all happens very true to life. Um, so, you don't just want someone to come up and tell you, oh, actually, I have all these insecurities. Uh, that's not how people operate in real life. So, that's also not how we do it in the game. Um, to do it, we try to tell stories that have emotional heft, and we want to make sure that any time people are playing through a quest and they're investing that time, they're feeling like there is a social consequence that's coming out of it. Um, we want to make sure all the, all the interactions are end up feeling realistic and genuine to how real people would act. Um, so on the right, you can see Peyton. She's another character in our game. And you first meet her as a party girl. And that's pretty much all you know about her, is that she likes to throw parties. She actually introduces our party and gameplay mechanic. So that probably makes sense. Um, but once you recruit her to your school and you get to know her a little better, you find out more about her background and her backstory. So I have a couple of clips that show this and how we do it. Um, I'm just going to show you the beginning and the end of the quest, um, just so you can see kind of the movement there. Um, so this first quest is an interaction between you and her, and she is going to an animal adoption event, and both you and her get more than you bargained for. Was it? in this chain, you spend running after rabbits and trying to stop a goat from eating everything in your school, and just general, the general fun you would have of having a bunch of animals at your school where they're not supposed to be. Um, but then when it's time for the animals to go home, you learn a little bit more about Peyton and why it was so important for her to have those animals. that example, the Peyton's Quest Party Animals, it starts off with you doing something fun in the foreground, but then we go deeper and you learn more about Peyton. So we're both telling the story and we're trying to grow the character. And to give you some context, over two million players have chosen to play and complete this quest. Alright, so one last example of building up drama and characters. 
So this is a special quest that we did um, about the topic of cyberbullying. Um, so I don't know how many people are familiar with the issue of cyberbullying, but um, it's a big problem right now, and not that it's a problem that not that many people know about or know the tools to deal with it because it's a relatively new issue. Um, so a lot of teens may be going to their parents and they have no context for what it is. They're saying, did someone punch you? I don't understand. How are you getting bullied? Um, and we found that it's a topic that really resonates with teens because it's something that a lot of them are going through. So we wanted to do a quest to address this, and we wanted to do it in a realistic way that both helped teens and also felt genuine and not necessarily just like a public service announcement. Um, so we introduced this character that you see on the screen. Her name's Hope, and she is Julian's little sister in the game. And the way that we wanted to introduce the topic, we didn't want to just have her coming to you for help because you don't know her. That wouldn't necessarily be very realistic. So we had it be that Julian comes to you for help. He's noticed that Hope is withdrawn and she's seeming depressed at school. And as a concerned older brother, he wants to get your help. So he comes to you and you take Hope out bowling. You buy her a milkshake. You try to get to know her. And through the course of getting to know her, you see her as she like gets a text and you see her face fall as she's, it's something mean that someone sent to her and you kind of get her to open up through the course of that. And once she starts talking to you, you find out people are sending her really mean messages, and she thinks she can handle it on her own. She doesn't want to make a big deal out of it. She doesn't want to go to her parents or the authorities because she thinks that they'll over-dramatize the whole situation, and she thinks she should be able to handle it. Um, and, of course, you, as a good friend, you know, you're not necessarily a responsible adult in this situation. You try to go along with her wishes, and you try to help her just by confronting the bullies directly. You try to help her ignore it, and all of it kind of comes to a head and ends up blowing up in your face, and you realize that you do need to get some bigger help from this. And so we partnered with a real cyberbullying charity for this, the Cyber Smile Foundation. And they both have resources for teens, and they also have a, an outreach program where teens can contact them and get help. And so by working with them, we were able to craft a real, a real scenario in the game that actually showed teens the steps to take when you are being cyberbullied and how we can help them in a realistic way. So a few quick facts about it. Over 2 million players have finished this quest, and over 100 players reach out to CyberSmile every week through our game. So that's teams who wouldn't necessarily have found CyberSmile without our game as kind of a gateway to get them there. And we've also donated over $200,000 to CyberSmile. All right, so story and gameplay. Any game can have romance is a famous quote by Royal McGraw. This is something he likes to say all the time during our brainstorms. Um, sometimes we talk about it more theoretically, and you know, particularly in preparing for GDC, we're saying any game can have romance in it, not just a game like ours about high school. So for example, in Where Is My Water, the alligator wants to get clean, but he wants to get clean because he's going on a date, and that gives him that little extra romantic push, like an extra motivation. Um, another example that we talk about in the office is if you were to challenge us to kind of put a romantic angle on Flappy Bird, uh, we might say he is trying to make it through this obstacle course of pipes because there is a ladybird on the other side that he is trying to get to, that is his true love. Um, but in our case, we are pretty lucky because we integrated this dating mechanic, so we don't have to stretch for it. It's right there. Um, in our game, you can send any two people in your school on a date. You just pick one from each column. And I have an example of a date here, where I've sent Peyton and Julian on a date together. And every time you collect on a date, well, every time you send people on a date, it takes a certain amount of time. And you can rush through the date, or you can let it play out. And then you get a little story that goes along with it. So here's an example. game you can have you can play matchmaker dates can be good bad or you can also salvage a bad date so let's say you spilled soup all over your date and that person is very upset maybe you buy them some flowers and everything ends up being okay um, you can also level up relationships with enough good dates so you know you can go from crushing to flirting to online official um, and you can also break up couples so we've seen a lot of player response to this dating mechanic and this putting romance in the game this way um, 
some of the examples are this one, which was posted on Tumblr, is someone saying, there was a quest where I had to break up a couple. It was not an easy choice. It was like watching my own kid go through their first breakup. Another example is people like to share the relationships that they put together, especially when they reach these new dating levels. So this couple is now crushing, and this person chose to share it and said, my babies, as the caption. Um, so the kind of takeaway from that is people like to see romance. When they get to you know, interact with it in the game, they want to share, they want to talk about it, and they want to come back and see how it's going. So some more player reactions, people saying they're too emotionally attached to high school story, barely downloaded it today, and high school story is becoming my life, but I honestly have no problem with that, and so on. Um, so we feel like it's working pretty well. All right, next I'm going to talk about interactive choices in our game. So we have all of these different mechanics at work, but we also have choices to make sure that the narrative is really drawing players and making them feel engaged. So we have two types of choices in our game. One is story choices, and another is pass-fail choices. So in a story choice, this is just how you want to interact with the game. Uh, here's an example. You're playing truth or dare. Do you want to pick truth, dare, or just making out? And there's no right or wrong answer here. It's really just how you want to play in the high school world, how you want to experience the scene, and how you want to see it play out. This is more of a test type mini game. Um, so this is pass fail. It kind of is checking how well you've been paying attention to the scene, and it's also checking you know how quickly you can read and react to this. So in this case, you're running across a muddy field. Do you keep your balance or do you freeze and fall? And each of these have a story-based reward. So if you keep your balance, you win the race, and everyone's very impressed. But if you freeze and fall, you're in the mud. Everyone's laughing at you. And we want to make sure in all of our writing that we give our choices consequences. So not only do we have the story, you know, the scene plays out how you want it to play out, or you see the reaction, but we also have hidden flags that our players don't necessarily know about. And we use those to track different variables in the game. So, for instance, Royal showed you at the beginning that you can choose to be a jock, a nerd, or a prep. And we track that choice in the game, and we call back to that in dialogue. So if you've chosen to play a jock, if someone asks you later if you like football, you might be like, of course, I'm a jock. Um, or if you're a nerd, you might say things that are more academic focused, and so on. Another example is the band choice. So I mentioned earlier that I have a band in the game. And you get the choice of what instrument you want to play. So you can pick guitar, vocals, or fiddle. <laughs> And then whenever your band plays, you'll get a call back to that, either in a scene or a mini game, where maybe you have to match the lyrics of the song you're singing or hit the right notes, and then that'll determine whether your band plays well or poorly. And then the last example I have about this is um, something we do on the back end of the game that, again, most players aren't aware of this. But in the very first choice that you make, you can pick whether you're a male or female character. Um, and if you choose to be a guy, in the very first confrontation, you'll be matched up against Max, who is an antagonist from the rival high school, Hurst High. And he and the head cheerleader there are both kind of an antagonistic duo. But in this case, if you're playing as a guy, you'll see him in the first confrontation. And your choices will be about how to deal with him as he tries to bully you. And if you're playing as a girl, then you'll square off against the head cheerleader. And this is one of the small tweaks that we make to the game just to give it context because if you're a female player and a male character comes up and tries to punch you, that has a very different connotation than if you're two guys fighting. Um, so this is, again, just something we do to try and make the world feel real and immersive and tailored to the player. Uh, so you might notice that in either path, your last choice there is that you can flirt with the bully that is antagonizing you. And we've noticed that this is something that is really popular in our game, especially when we see people playing through YouTube videos of, like, they'll do a playthrough and show themselves progressing through the tutorial. And usually they're pretty straightforward about everything until they get to this choice, which is the point where they laugh out loud and stop for a moment because they don't expect a game like ours to make a joke like this and not take itself too seriously. Um, so that brings me to my last point of comedy and fun. Um, so we found it's very important to try to delight and impress the players. And whether that's through being silly, clever, or surprising, you just want to do something that kind of sets the story apart. So I have some examples of our most shared moments on Tumblr and Facebook and Twitter. Um, and I'll just walk through those and kind of why we think that they are funny. Um, so this is a post from Tumblr. And this is a character in the game talking about Tumblr. Uh, this, this line was written by Royal. That's a Royal McGraw original. 
and it's about talking about how this character has been, been posted about on Tumblr, which is something we see our players doing. And she is using all the Tumblr terminology that we could fit into one line of dialogue. And the caption of this is, why I love high school story. So in this case, we feel like the players feel like we get them. We understand what they're doing. We understand how they talk. Another example of something that has been posted is this item description of a potted plant. Um, <laughs> not necessarily a place where you expect to see a joke, um, but because we try to pack humor in everywhere and make it just feel like a cohesively fun world, uh, this player chose to post about it. And lastly, I have an example of a date in the game. So in this date, is, which is one of the ones we see most posted about, Peter and Kalea, this is a real fan post of this example. So Peter and Kalea stayed up all night playing High School Story, and they named two characters after themselves and sent them on a date. And then they had an amazing time together in the game and in real life. It's so meta. And players like this one because they're, again, not expecting us to, to take the step, I guess, of being a little bit silly. And as one player put it, my game just murdered the fourth wall. Um, <laughs> and they're, all of the posts about it are kind of along this line of they're surprised, they're delighted, and they really appreciate that we're trying to you know, make the game a little bit more clever than it needed to be. All right, so all this romance, all this drama, all this comedy. So on, on the one hand, it's just like giving players a very enjoyable experience. But on the other hand, it directly impacts the bottom line. All right. So most apps we're seeing, uh, I'm just going to take an aside to marketing. Uh, most apps we're seeing, uh, when they're trying to grab non-incentivized installs, uh, they're paying for about two for every one organic install that they receive. Uh, because we've been able to tap into our player base and get them posting on Tumblr, get them posting on Twitter, sharing on Facebook, because they're talking, because they're having a good time, they're having something that's emotional, they're sharing it. So we launched in, on August 1st. Uh, we're still seeing a paid-to-organic ratio of one to three. That means we're, we're purchasing one install for every three that we're getting organically. Uh, Another benefit, uh, this, is, this was something that was sort of unexpected. Uh, when we put together our writing team, we, we knew that we wanted a big narrative game. But what we didn't expect was that we were going to end up with a pretty savvy marketing unit as well. Uh, because we're generating all these quests every week, you know, in October we're thinking about Christmas. We're thinking about ways to hook the player for events that are happening far in the future. And that basically works out to marketing as well. So we're generating all of our marketing copy in-house. Uh, I've heard a lot of talk at GDC. I've seen numbers on the internet. It seems to be about $2.50 for a non-incentivized install these days on mobile. Uh, we're still averaging under a buck twenty-five. All right. So the final point on stories uh, is cliffhangers. Let me see if we've got... West dressed up like Indiana Jones. But this is, you know, it's, it's a joke, but it's also really true. Uh, cliffhangers really are one of the most important tactics for ensuring that our players return. Uh, the first one, the first aspect of it is just functional. Uh, we release two to three new quests every week, but even with that, some of our players are at the bleeding edge of the content that we deliver. So when they finish their weekly quest drop, there literally is nothing else for them to play quest-wise in the game. That means it needs to be exciting, it has to have some sort of emotional hook, some sort of narrative surprise, something that gets them to say, you know, in seven days, I want to come back. Uh, the second aspect uh, is, you know, our bread and butter. Uh, we need each of our links in our quest chain to be exciting, to have something that's compelling, something that's driving it forward so that players will either choose to rush through that, eliminate the timer with a premium purchase, or they'll uh, come back when the timer ends. So here's an example. Uh, we had a quest chain with a mysterious figure named Pandora. Uh, she was sort of blackmailing your classmates. She was making them do things like jump in a fountain or embarrass themselves in others, other ways. This was a big, long quest chain. It lasted about a month. Uh, our players were really eager to figure out who Pandora is. They really, really wanted to know. Uh, so Wes, one of your friends, he runs up and is like, guys, I know who Pandora is. You tap through, and of course, you know, you hit your 24-hour wait wall. Uh, 
And of course, you know, some of our players are going to come back the next day, and we really like that. Some of our players are going to choose to rush through. So the question is, how many of our players are choosing to rush through based on these cliffhangers? Well, 83% of all of our users have rushed at some point. Um, the caveat is that we're pretty liberal with our premium currency in the early game. Uh, but still, I mean, they're choosing to rush through to go from story to more story rather than spending their rings on premium decorations or premium outfits or any of the other things that they could choose to purchase. So for cliffhangers, if, if you're going to implement them, the th these are the things that sort of you want to focus on. The first is positive worry. Uh, you love your grandmother if she's sick. You want her to get better. And the same is true of like classmates in the school. If they care about them, if they're in a tight spot, uh, the players will want to see them out of that spot. Uh, need to know. The Pandora Quest is a good example of that. If you have a mystery, if you have some puzzle that will be solved, fans are eager to move forward through that. And then the last one is just delayed gratification. Everybody has a favorite TV show. There's a big explosive season finale. You're wondering, okay, what's, what's going to happen next? How are they going to get out of this spot? Are they going to make it? Well, you're going to have to come back you know, in the fall when the show starts back up again. So earlier I talked about story gating story. Uh, and I want to get back to that. The first, the first aspect of that is just simply when you complete a quest, you're rewarded with a new quest. And fans are very eager for this. They want more story. It really hooks them. Uh, but once you know fans are really eager for story, once, once they, you have them hooked in this sort of narrative world, then at that point, you know, it, it's not a, a big step to say, okay, maybe we'll offer some premium storylines. Maybe we'll offer some quests that they'll have to pay for. Uh, so we've done that, and our premium quest chains offer, first off, more time with characters you like. Say, for instance, Autumn. She's the first character you meet at the school. She's sort of in the game world, your best friend. Uh, we had a quest harvest festival. You got to see where she spent her summers as a, as a kid and just spend more time bonding with her. We offer unique emotional experiences. Over the Christmas break, uh, we had a quest where you could choose who you were going to spend time with under the mistletoe. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and we also offer opportunities to do something fun that's a little bit elevated from the traditional high school context. So uh, you could fly to Paris to like view a runway fashion show. You could go to Los Angeles uh, to see a red carpet premiere. So this is Haunted Hearts. It was a premium quest we released during uh, Halloween. Uh, you can see that it cost 100 rings. Now, the, the four gas lamps it requires are also premium decorations. They cost 25 rings apiece. So that's 200 rings total, which works out to about $1.40 in real U.S. currency. All right, so how many of our players are actually buying these premium quests? Well, 63% of our players have purchased a premium quest at some point. Again, same caveats, we're pretty, we're pretty generous with our premium currency. But here's the real number that's, that's pretty great. Uh, during the initial week of launch, 25% of all of our active users purchased Haunted Hearts. All right, so I'm going to recap a bit, and then we're going to get to sort of what this gets you with retention. So good game writing, as Kara mentioned. It's memorable characters. We recommend for mobile uh, to start broad, start with stereotypes, and then deepen them over time after they've found their footing, after the players have found their footing. Uh, romance and drama, you really cannot have too much romance. Uh, choices and consequences, every choice a player makes makes the experience theirs. The more theirs it is, the more likely they are to come back. Comedy and fun, uh, if you can give a player something that delights them, something that surprises them, they're going to share it. Uh, and that, that's so huge. And then cliffhangers, you know, if you can figure out a way to make them come back narratively, that's so, so powerful. And if you can do all these things, story becomes its own reward. They'll move through the quest, and what they'll want is another quest, and they'll keep coming back and keep coming back. All right, good game writing is not over long. Uh, you know, if you're starting off with a five-minute history of your world, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you should get some something funny, something heartfelt, and then if you really have to after a player is hooked, that's the time for the history lesson. Uh, it's not present for its own sake. Everything should be tethered. Um, we tethered dating. Figure out a way to make your storyline integrate seamlessly. Uh, it's not self-indulgent. You know, In an ideal world, your interests would 
align with your players' interests 100% of the time. That's just not true. Uh, so write for your players. Always remember who your players are and, and see if you can tap into the things that they know. Uh, and good game writing is not lacking in delight or surprise. If a player is surprised, they're going to talk. They're just going to talk. All right. So very good retention in a mobile game these days. Uh, there's, there are a variety of numbers, but what we've seen and what we're sort of basing our, our claims on is this idea of one day, 60%. After one week, 40%. After one month, 10%. I've, I've heard some talk at GDC about some apps that are averaging 20 or 30% one day retention. Well, where are we with high school story? For high school story, we've seen one day retention of 71%. After a week, we've still got over half of all of our users. And after a month, we've still got a third. Just so you can sort of visualize this. This is the difference we're talking about. All right. So hopefully, as a takeaway, uh, we've convinced you that Story can be a really powerful tool to aid retention. Uh, we definitely recommend that you add Story if you can. Uh, we recommend you add it judiciously. Uh, we think you should integrate story early with writers. Writers are really good at shaping emotional experience. And if you can shape that emotional experience, your players will be drawn in. And then, you know, finally, don't be afraid to revise or cut. Uh, and that's <laughs> cutting, cutting is so important. All right, uh, I think that's about it. Uh, we want to thank you guys for, for showing up on Friday. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and We'll, uh, we'll take questions. Hello. My name is Martin. Um, this is a narrative story with a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. And, you know, gamers say, well, nobody reads, which, of course, is not true, but... I wonder if you can think of any examples of games that have used story very, very well without all the reading and conveying it visually. Uh, the question was, are there any games that have used story very well uh, that do not have all this reading? Uh, do you want to take this? I'll think uh, about it. <laughs> uh, right off the bat, I'd, I'd point to Brothers. Uh, did a remarkable job of, of character work without any dialogue that was either spoken or, or written on screen. Uh, you know. well, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would, you, would you like any more, or is this that good for you? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, yeah, you had talked uh, briefly about um, players kind of spamming through some of those uh, repetitive uh, pop-ups with, with the narrative being delivered. I'm, it's kind of a twofold question. Uh, do you think that there's anything particular, particularly special that you guys are doing to really engage people at that time? And do you have any metrics that, you know, are actually testing whether or not people are spamming through them or actually sit, staying around to read them? Uh, I, we don't actually have any metrics on whether or not players are spamming through uh, I can tell you that we keep our dialogues a little shorter at the beginning of the game and then gradually ramp up the duration of them. So they get longer as the game goes on. All right. If you play through the tutorial of our game, there's not too much dialogue to spam through. So yeah. hopefully just keeping it short enough. It yeah. Play. So we, we ease them into the, to the length of the narrative. Yeah. And I also think putting in choices is another way of breaking up things for people who are spamming because if they get to a choice point, then they might realize, like, oh, I should have been paying attention because now someone's asking me, you know, like, what the combination to the safe is or something, and I need to know that to, to get my coin reward. Uh, next question. Hi. Uh, so your system is very, like, open for addition and stuff with it, how you're adding quests every week. Is there anything you can say about, like, the process of coming up with this system that was very easy to add more story and stuff without, like, <coughs> messing with the world in a sense? Yeah, okay, so the question is, how do we keep adding more to the story without breaking it? <laughs> kind of. um, I think from the beginning we knew this was going to be an ongoing narrative, so we tried to brainstorm everything from the characters that we were using to the type of story that we were telling around kind of these big narrative chunks. So the, there's two kinds of quests in the, in the app. There's the main storyline, 
Um, so there's a main storyline where you're kind of pitted up against Hearst High, and when that's over, there's another storyline that Royal touched on, which is the Pandora arc. And then in between playing those, you also get you know the seasonal quests and the other types of content. So I think part of it is having a big plan when you start so that you know the bold strokes of where you're going. And then that way, all the other quests that are coming in, you know not to step on, like when it's toes not to step on, like you can say, well, Julian's going to be having some trouble, so you should not talk about Julian in this other quest until like much later. Oh, okay. Do you do you have a, a lot of revisions based on the, the user feedback? I mean, do you, do you monitor how they react to the story? Do you have to rewrite based on you know, how they like it? Uh, the question is, do we react to feedback from our fans? Um, yeah, we definitely <laughs> react to feedback from our fans. Um, we're always we're very curious on the writing team, so we like to follow our Twitter account and our forum and see how people are reacting, and we definitely had times where people have said, you know, like, well, this character seems like they're good at everything, and we're like, oh, well, we're going to make her really bad at something next, <laughs> um, and things like that. So we definitely pay attention. In terms of revising things that are already out, um, we'll definitely tweak things if people mention something that we feel really hits home. Um, for the most part, though, our internal revision, I think, catches most of the things because it's just such a rigorous process of review and peer review that we end up getting a lot of our editing in that way. Uh, uh, do all gamers, uh, all players essentially get the same narrative experience, or is there opportunities where someone can branch in one direction and close off a bunch of quests that they can never do? Uh, so uh, the, uh, the question is about if we, if choices make you so that things branch off and block off different pathways. Um, I'd say for the most part we try not to limit players because we don't want them to, we don't want people to feel frustrated with this game, and because there's no real way to replay it without starting over from the very beginning, um, we're not expecting anyone to do that, um, especially since it's ongoing. So we wouldn't want players to feel like, oh, you, you know, because I did this, I didn't realize, I totally missed out on forming my own band or something like that. So for the most part, we try to let players play everything, but it definitely is customized to the choices that you've made, if that makes sense. Yeah, the one exception to that would be seasonal quests, which if they don't access them in a timely fashion, they'll right. just never see them. So some players will see content that other players do not. Okay, thanks. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between the writers and maybe the monetization team or the live ops team and how those things, how these two kind of parallel paths that in the end have to result in monetization, how do writers, how do, how do you deal with that tension between the writers and, and uh, live ops or monetization team? So the question is how do we reconcile the differences between what the monetization team does and what the writing team does. Uh, the <laughs> uh, our CEO likes to joke that we have zero monetization experts, uh, and that's basically true, other than than him and, and one of our writers. And all, the writing team all wears multiple hats, uh, so you know the, the, w one of our writers is, is doing work on the monetization. So it's not the, there's no butting heads on it. We're all sort of like moving in the same direction. Yeah, because we have so many writers in-house, it's a lot more of, you know, everyone's kind of looking at the numbers and understanding where, how everything is happening. So there's not that much, I guess, tension because just every, there's so much visibility. So people understand, you know, like, we have to do it this way. And they're like, okay, we'll come up with a really good narrative that works for that. Um, can you tell us about the statistics uh, um, of the uh, users? What? Teens, uh, older. Okay, uh, I, I, can, I can speak to that. Um, so the short answer is that uh, because of the Child Online Privacy and Protection Act, uh, we do not track uh, anything internally. Our best uh, metrics come from uh, Facebook uh, because the users have to be over 13 to sign in for that. Uh, so we can see that data. Uh, because of that, we have some limited amount of data from our ad partners. Uh, our principal uh, demographic is uh, 13 to 22, so high school and college students. That may be a little off, uh, just again because we cannot track uh, younger players. Uh, yeah, was that was that helpful? Uh, I, I would say we, we definitely skew heavily female. Uh, <laughs> you, you might have uh, caught that from the Twitter post. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can talk more about that uh, a little later if you'd like. Um, it seems like you're adding a lot of story and a lot of quests pretty frequently. And you, I saw up there there's eight writers and 16 people total in the studio. 
Um, how, what kind of tools have you guys built so that, you know, once someone writes a quest, it's actually not that much engineering effort, I hope, to actually publish it into something that's a user would see, because it looks like there's a lot of emotional reaction to what the character is saying. There's a lot of stuff that seems to happen in the background. So uh, can you just talk a little bit about the tools you've developed and the workflow that you have to publish that number of quests? Yeah, so our workflow is um, we have really great tools set up by our developers. Um, so the writers are actually able to take it from, you know, story all the way to playable um, ourselves. And, well, we have the help of an intern who's really great at <laughs> messing around with some files for us. Um, but we don't need any development help to do it. And so that's one of the best tools is that we're able to just play it immediately and see how it plays in the game. You know, we're able to try it out and be like, oh, well, this wait feels really long or something like that. Um, all right. All right. As evidenced by your cyberbullying uh, quest, it seems you, that you have a really good uh, soapbox available to you. How do you decide when to engage with issues? Um, that, that has a lot to do with Oliver, our CEO. Um, but I, I think we're really big on uh, using our platform to try and do some good in the world. Yeah, and we're definitely looking at other topics to cover. Um, so I think we're always kind of on the lookout for it. The thing we just want to be most careful about is always doing it in a way that feels very genuine to players and never coming off as too preachy or like we're throwing too much at them. Um, you know, definitely since we had such a good response to people um, from our Cyber Smile campaign that we did, I think we're definitely working on, like right now, trying to figure out our next step on that. Okay. Okay. Really far away. Uh, so, uh, high school story seems pretty specific to a lot of North American high school in terms of narrative. Is that? Do you find that that's limiting in terms of your audience? That it skews very American, or do you try to write it in a neutral way so that it's a little more access accessible to, to Europeans and, and other and other and other people? So the question is: Is high school accessible to areas outside of uh, North America? Uh, so we have chosen, uh, because we have so much story content, that obviously we, we have not localized to other regions. So that would limit our accessibility uh, right off the bat. Uh, that being said, uh, we've done very well in the United Kingdom. So clearly we can, we can go across the pond. Uh, I think if we were trying to transition uh, more fully to uh, Asian markets, China, Japan, uh, we would have additional concerns in terms of art style that we would, we would want to address as well before we, we, we went big there. Well, connected to that question is the idea that North America, of course, has people from many, many countries. <laughs> and you have a lot of ethnic diver diversity here. And how much do you make an effort to reflect that in your storytelling? And then on, on a connected note, how often do you get players who actually do flirt with the bully of the same gender? <laughs> um, yeah, we've actually, the question is about diversity and same gender flirting. So one of the mechanics in the game is dating, and you can have, you know, girls dating girls and guys dating guys, and we've seen just an overwhelmingly positive response on Tumblr and social media is about it. Um, and also just putting diversity in the cast is something that was very important to us from the beginning. So. You know, you can see from the examples that we've had up here, and also if you play the game, the cast is very diverse. So, yeah, that's definitely a factor for us. So I'm impressed by both the retention numbers you guys share, but also the virality numbers in terms of organic installs you guys get. And I know from all the examples you've shown and what you guys mentioned just now, that a lot of it is through social media channels, player-initiated. How much do you guys do in terms of in-game sharing that makes that process easier, or do you guys do any? Uh, how much in-game uh, sharing do we do? Uh, we, you can link, uh, you can you can link to Facebook. Uh, you okay. can share uh, or or Game Center uh, or Google Play if you're on Android. But uh, I would say uh, that is actually an area that we need to work on um, making that process easier. So it, it's exactly what you said. It's really user originated. Um, yeah. Yeah. At the end of usually a quest, like, or a date, a screen will pop up, and if you're logged in through Twitter or Facebook, it'll ask the player, like, do you want to share this? And so we do see, a, you know, it's people some, using some that amount. button because it's right there next to, like, OK. So sometimes people, you know, will just share whatever we've, we've prompted them to post. Thanks. 
All right. Uh, I think that's it for questions. Thank you guys all so much for uh, for coming out and watching the talk. Thank you.